In the last chapter, we saw the authority that Jesus had in teaching and in casting out unclean spirits. Today, we will see the authority that he has in forgiving sins and over the Sabbath itself. But not everybody likes what they are seeing. Greetings and welcome to the Bible Paladin. Today, we will continue to explore the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Mark's Gospel. And if you are enjoying the content of this channel, consider subscribing so that you won't miss any new episodes. It's free. Getting back to Mark, we begin this chapter with Jesus returning to Capernaum despite his popularity and the crowds. And we immediately jump into a miracle story, but this one has a twist. We see that the religious leaders seem to object to this manner of Jesus' teaching and healing. Let us begin this as we ask for the guidance of the Holy Spirit as we read the sacred word. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. We notice a few things right away as we begin this narrative. First, we are told that Jesus returns to Capernaum, which is equated with his home now. Even though he was originally from Nazareth, Capernaum quickly becomes his new home, and he most likely stayed at Simon's house. And if you want to hear more about Capernaum, be sure to check out this previous video. And then we are told of this miracle. First, we are reminded of the crowds, the crowds that really kept him from coming into towns in the first place. And ironically, because of these crowds, the one who wants to be healed really can't make it to Jesus. And so we hear this other story about faith and ingenuity. Because the man is paralyzed and on a mat or stretcher, and the crowds make it impossible to carry him through the door, his friends lift him up to the roof and they dig through it, most likely being made from thatch and mud. Then they are able to lower him right in front of Jesus. What I love about this story is not only the faith of the one who wants to be healed, but that of those who find a way to get him to Jesus. This would also have included the cooperation of many in the crowds, as well as the four men to get him up onto the roof and lowered. For me, this shows the importance of community and how oftentimes people are brought to Jesus by others. Then Jesus says something surprising to the man. Son, your sins are forgiven. Now the man wasn't asking for spiritual healing, but for physical healing. So why does Jesus say this? Well, the teachers of the law were thinking the same thing, but perhaps for a different reason. So let's look a bit closer at this. Firstly, the message of both John and Jesus that we've seen so far is one of repentance and forgiveness. So this aligns with his ministry. Also, many during this time believed that illness or disability were caused by sin as a physical sign of punishment. The spiritual and physical were united so that the healing of one would cure the other. And theologically, Christians would understand this to be a reflection of Jesus' ministry as a whole, as he was the one who takes away the sins of the world, and thus also heals the effects of sin. Then we come to the teachers of the law, as Mark calls them. These are the scripture scholars and theologians of Jesus' time. You're one of them? Well, hopefully we've learned a thing or two since then. But anyhow, their line of thinking is that Jesus is equating himself with God because only God can forgive sins, and so what he says is blasphemy. And Jesus' answer to them sounds cryptic at first. He asks which is easier to say, that which he said, or an instruction that indicates that the man has been healed. It is a trick question, for either response would anger the teachers, as Jesus knows. 
but he is showing them that he indeed has the authority to forgive sins, basically confirming their accusation against him. Of course, not slander if it's true. I mean, right? It's not blasphemy if it's true. But Jesus is also showing that his works of healing are not only physical, but spiritual as well. This passage is the first that sets the scene of division between the Jewish religious leaders and the Jewish ordinary people. The regular folk were amazed and praised God, while the teachers were suspicious and angered, finding fault in a good deed. This tension is one that continues to grow, and unfortunately is one that has to be continuously relearned. The next few verses continue to show this tension as we hear about another who was called and the reaction to this calling. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And so Jesus calls Levi, the tax collector, and he and his disciples have dinner with him and his tax collector friends. Wait, Levi, the son of Alphaeus? Wasn't the name of the tax collector Matthew? At least, that's what it says in Matthew's gospel. In fact, this whole section is almost identical in his gospel other than the name. So what's going on here? Well, most early Christian scholars understood Levi and Matthew to be both referring to the same person, and going by two names was not uncommon. In fact, Jesus may have even changed his name from Levi to Matthew, especially if he wanted to leave behind any memory of his tax-collecting days. And because Matthew is the name listed in the names of the twelve apostles, that is the name that has been passed on over the centuries. Now, there were some early scholars, such as Origen, who believed that perhaps they were different people, and that Levi never became one of the twelve while Matthew did. I have a link to an article about this below if you are interested. But due to the similarity of such stories and the subsequent tradition, it seems likely that they were indeed the same person. So what's the deal with tax collectors anyway? Why were they so hated and despised and considered sinners? Well, firstly, if they were Jewish, they were seen as betraying their country because they were collecting taxes for Rome, whom they were occupied by. Secondly, while tax collectors did earn a wage, they were expected to take a commission from those they taxed for themselves, and this was unmonitored. Many became wealthy due to this, so they were typically believed to be cheats who stole from their own countrymen. And finally, They often used harsh tactics to collect taxes, such as threats of physical violence or imprisonment for those who did not pay. All in all, they were seen as traitors and the lowest of the low. With that in mind, one might not blame the reaction of the teachers and Pharisees to Jesus' apparent acceptance of this group of individuals. So Jesus eats with Levi and his associates, all of who would not be considered the more ideal or virtuous Jews. But this does show us a few things. Meals are important not just for the consumption of food, but as a ritual in which people gather, get to know each other, and even conduct business. For Jesus, it was also a big part of his ministry, and one way in which he preached and recognized the dignity of others. And Jesus' association with this group showed that he was willing to do even what was unpopular in order to bring others into the fold. Of course, the teachers of the law are offended by this, and approach not Jesus, but his disciples, But before they can respond, Jesus jumps in and tells the Pharisees that it is the sick that are in need of a physician and not the healthy. And this healing or this story actually echoes the healing from before, except that this time the people that Jesus is speaking with are spiritually sick, not physically sick. And what Jesus does is shows that they are indeed sinners. They are in need of someone to heal them. And so he is not commending their actions or their lifestyle, but saying that he is here to save them from it. The next few verses give us the first example of a saying or parable of Jesus in which he uses everyday language to try to explain his teachings. And now at this point, Jesus was considered a rabbi who had his own students. And so the other teachers of the law are wondering, what does he require of his students? What sort of discipline does he ask of them? And so let us continue reading. 
Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. Even though John the Baptist was in prison, there were many who still followed his teaching and aesthetic lifestyle, which included fasting. Now, for most Jews, though, the only real day of fasting was the Day of Atonement from the Mosaic Law. However, at this time in history, many of the Jews did fast four times throughout the year based on the writings from Zechariah, which occurred after the Babylonian exile. However, the Pharisees even took this further by fasting twice a week on Mondays and Thursdays. And they did this really as a show of piety. And so at this point, the Pharisees are asking Jesus and his disciples, well, when do you fast? Why aren't you fasting when the rest of us are? Jesus uses a few examples to give his answer. The first is quite obvious, for weddings were joyous occasions, often lasting a week. No one would fast during such a time. Jesus compares himself to the bridegroom and his disciples as his guests. But he also makes a minor prediction of things to come when he suggests that they will fast when he is taken away from them. Jesus is indicating that he represents something or someone more important so much so that his followers are blessed by his very presence. The second pair of examples speaks to the practice of the Pharisees about practicing old rituals without being aware of something new. Both the example of sewing the old patches and using the old wineskins speak of ruining the very thing that they are trying to preserve. In the case of wine, goat skins were used to hold the wine which would expand as it fermented. A used skin, which had already been stretched, would break again if used. The Pharisees are stuck doing the same rituals and practices without realizing that something greater is happening. They are trying to put Jesus into a box, and that box will not contain him. The last story in this chapter is about the Sabbath, and how Jesus and his disciples seem to be a bit more lax in regards to how they observe it. So, let's continue reading. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples walked along. They began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. To be fair, the followers of Jesus were only breaking the Sabbath based on a very strict interpretation of the law. Indeed, Exodus 34 verse 21 does say that one must not harvest on the Sabbath, but was casually picking off the heads of grain as they walked along for a quick snack, really considered harvesting. According to the Mishnah, or tradition of the elders, which would have been part of a Jewish oral tradition at this point, what they were doing would technically be considered harvesting. And this is where the Jewish leaders try to trap Jesus. Jesus responds by referring to a story that the Pharisees would be familiar with, and one that was directly from the Hebrew scriptures instead of a rabbinic interpretation of it. Knowing that they will not take his own authority, he provides them with an authority that they must respect. If you want to read the story that Jesus is referencing, it is 1 Samuel 21, verses 1 through 6. And while the story itself shows that the law can be broken in special circumstances, he is also suggesting that he is greater than King David. And then to upset them even more, Jesus tells them that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And this really goes back all the way to the creation story in Genesis. Man was made on the sixth day, And the last day of the week was then dedicated for rest, not just for God, but for man. I mean, God really doesn't need rest, so it was indeed made for humanity. And the law further expounds on the nature of this rest from work. It was not meant to be a burden, but rather a gift. And yet many religious leaders had turned it into something difficult and burdensome. 
the exact opposite of its intention. And then Jesus makes a couple of claims, as we see him once again use the title, the Son of Man, as he says, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. In the Old Testament, Son of Man could simply refer to any human being and was used quite often. Welcome, Peter, son of Adam. But by the time the Gospels were written, it was much more closely associated with the Messiah. The Son of Man was the one that was prophesied, the anointed one of God. So here, it is possible that Jesus is using the expression to mean both. One, based on his previous statement, that humans really are the masters of the Sabbath, but also that he, as the Messiah, has authority over what can and can't be done on the Sabbath. Both interpretations, of course, would anger the Pharisees, although they too use their own human interpretations of what is allowed on the Sabbath. So where does that leave us with these stories? Well, the first story of the healing of the paralytic is one that we'll see quite often in the Bible, stories of healing and forgiveness. But this one also offers us something unique. It was the person's friends that brought him to Jesus. They had experienced, heard, or encountered Christ in some way in their lives, and they wanted to share that with somebody else. And so they brought this person, this paralytic, to Jesus. In fact, it shows that they were in some ways the very first evangelists or missionaries. The story about Levi is also one about community and the effects of hearing the gospel. Jesus enters into a community that was despised, a group that had indeed betrayed their people, a people that Jesus was part of. But that was not the initial focus. He begins instead with an invitation, follow me. This invitation contains so much. Certainly there is the actual literal understanding of follow me. Levi will physically follow Jesus. He will become one of his students. He will travel with them. He will learn at the feet of the master. But also it entails a complete change of Levi's lifestyle. He will not be able to go back to the person that he was before. He will have to change. He will have to think about new ways of doing things. And in the process, he will probably lose a lot of his friends and families. But what a life that he will gain in return. The message that comes across to those who read these narratives is the same invitation. We are invited to a greater life, but one that comes with sacrifice. We too may have to let go of certain things or behaviors. It is not enough to say, now I found Jesus. I mean, he seems to have no problem eating with sinners. He meets me where I'm at. Sure, he meets us where we are at, but he doesn't leave us there. That's the catch. He compares himself to a doctor that comes to heal. To take this analogy a little bit further, a doctor won't attempt to treat a smoker's lungs without advocating that he stop smoking or treat the symptoms of one who is obese without prescribing a change in diet and exercise. When Jesus invites us to follow him, he is inviting us to a change in lifestyle. Our spiritual health is that which is in need of healing, but that healing requires proper care and exercise. And like exercise, it's so much easier when we find others to train with. This is where community comes in. This is where church comes in. Jesus is forming a community as he is calling his followers. People are working together to come to Jesus and to bring others to him. I know the concept of religion has gotten a bad rep over the centuries, and sometimes for good reason. And the idea of being spiritual only has become quite popular. But a personal spirituality can only take one so far. Practicing the faith requires a community where we can share our experiences, keep each other accountable, and worship together. This isn't to say that we can't become too dependent on religion and forget who we are really called to worship. And this is where Jesus' conflict with the Pharisees comes in and the teachers of the law. And as we continue reading Mark's gospel, we'll look a little bit more closely about this and how Jesus' interpretation of the law is really different than his religious leaders of the time. What are your takeaways from this second chapter of Mark? Are you part of a faith community, or do you find that a personal relationship with the Lord is all you really need at this point in your life? I'd love to hear your perspective on this as well. Thank you so much for joining me, and I do look forward to next time as we see how Jesus really changes the definition of sacred time and sacred space. Until next time, continue to seek the Lord, and God bless.